The last time Calvin and Hobbes appeared in a newspaper was December 31st, 1995, 25 years ago. And there was an article in the Star Trib on Tuesday um, that talks about the staying power of Calvin and Hobbes. Even 25 years later, they're still around, even though they haven't been merchandised as other um, comic strip characters have been. And uh, the article talks about um, what it is about this comic strip that sort of uh, holds on to people. It's this rebellious little boy, this six-year-old boy, who many of us can relate to, and his um, best pal, his stuffed tiger, Hobbes, and their adventures, and Hobbes is with him pretty much all the way. They, they fight, they argue, they create, they laugh, they play, they philosophize, they have great fun together. They are the best of friends. And the comic strip itself is, is funny, it's um, touching, uh, colorful, beautifully done, striking in its colors, it's creative, it's lively, it's also philosophical and gets you thinking. I have several books of Calvin and Hobbes cartoons. Um, I love that comic strip and was very sad when it ended. One of the books actually was given to me by a, a young person I had in confirmation who knew how much I liked the comic strip. But there's one um, that sticks in my head, perhaps because it's uh, vivid and I can relate. Calvin comes in the back door of the house and yells, Mom! And she's in the living room, the other end of the house. She says, Calvin, don't stand there and yell at me by the door. If you want to talk to me, you can come in here and talk to me. And so he treks all the way through the house until he's standing beside her chair and she's sitting there reading. And he says, Mom? She says, yes, Calvin. Mom, I stepped in dog dew. Where's the hose? <laughs> yes, that is just quintessential Calvin. And that's why I love this strip. Well, Bill Watterson, who was the creator of this, said um, in the, the collection that he made, everything having to do with Calvin and Hobbes expressed my own ideas, my own values, my own way. I wrote every word, drew every line, painted every color. It's a rare gift to find such fulfilling work. And I tried to show my appreciation by giving the strip everything I had to offer. That's fascinating. He said it was all his, and it was all him, and it all came from him, and yet it was a gift to which he was compelled to give himself. That's kind of biblical, it seems to me. It's kind of Jesus-y from my perspective. And if you notice, Jesus has left the synagogue. He was in the synagogue last week. He, he healed or what? Um, exorcised the demons from this one man, set him free. And afterwards, after the service is over, at the time the synagogue is over, they go to Simon and Andrew's home for Sabbath dinner. Now, Simon's mother-in-law, so obviously there's a wife in the picture somewhere. Simon is married, was married, his wife, but she's not mentioned. We don't know anything about her. But his mother-in-law is mentioned, and she would normally be, as the senior female in the house, would be the one in charge of hospitality. And in that culture, the bread server and sharer is as important as the bread winner. Hospitality is crucial. You bring honor to your family by creating and, and presenting a hospitable uh, place. And there are stories about sometimes God shows up or sometimes God's angels show up at your house. And so hospitality is crucial. But this woman who would be overseeing this and presenting this is not able to do her job because she's sick. So Jesus goes and heals her. And it says he lifts her up, takes her by the hand, and raises her. And the word that's used is the same word that's used at the end of the gospel when Jesus is raised from the dead. 
So we're talking God's power here. We're talking resurrection power here. That's what's at work in him in case we miss that. And so he allows her not just, this isn't just, okay, now you can make us dinner, uh, women's work, that sort of thing, because that's sometimes the way people react. This is a theological thing. Jesus enables people to fulfill their calling. Um, he heals them, makes them whole so that they can do their job in the community and bring wholeness to the community. That's what this is about, I think. And so he enables that. Well, at the end of the Sabbath day, apparently word is out as to what happened in the synagogue in the morning. And Mark tells us that the whole town shows up at the door, <laughs> which is kind of incredible. Um, and apparently there's a lot of sick and possessed people in Capernaum. So they're all hauled there. Uh, and I guess we all have our demons. We all have those things that possess us and drive us or drive others crazy, the things that we do. So people show up to be freed, to be healed. And Jesus is doing that. And I imagine it goes till <laughs> late. So he crashes then, but wakes up early while everyone's still asleep. It's still very dark, Mark tells us. And he goes out by himself, away from everything and everyone, to, as the GPS voice would say, recalibrate. He's recalibrating after all of this activity. And what happens as he's doing that, as he's getting his bearings? Simon and the other, the, these new associates of Jesus, hunt him down. They track him down. They don't let him have his time, which he needs. They don't respect that. They find him and they say, Jesus, what are you doing out here? Everybody's looking for you. You are the man of the hour, man. Come on, you are famous. We got we to gotta nail this. We got to, you know, strike while the iron's hot here. Come on. And I imagine Simon thinking, man, this thing is taken off like right now. And all these people are gathering, so we got to just keep this thing going. And maybe we can create a little empire here. This can, Capernaum can become, you know, like Jesus town or something. And he can take over and I can be his agent and we can schedule things. And, and pretty soon we can maybe rival Herod or whatever. I don't know. Whatever is in his head. But Jesus has gone to that inner place, even though he's gone outside of where everybody is. He goes out to go within to let things settle, to become quiet after all of this activity and all of these people, to go to that place where that inner light does shine, sometimes gets pretty shrouded in stuff, taking time to let the view come. And I imagine him then looking at Simon with his head sort of cocked and saying something like, really? Seriously? S Simon, who called whom to this? Who's driving this thing anyway? And where is it taking us? Do you have any idea? In the winter of 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. was traveling around, especially in the South, speaking and trying to um, build energy for what was going to be the Poor People's March and Campaign in Washington, D.C. It was to happen in April of 1968, and an army of people, many poor, poverty-stricken people, were to, to assemble and sort of peacefully occupy our nation's capital, demanding economic justice and staying there until promises are made and things begin to happen. He's speaking and touring on behalf of the Southern um, Christian Leadership Conference. But he gets diverted to Tennessee, to Memphis, Tennessee, because there's a sanitation workers strike going on. On the 1st of February, well, uh, let me give you a little background. 
um, sanitation workers or garbage workers, we'll just call them garbage workers, um, at that time in that part of the country had no benefits, they were paid minimum wage, um, there's no workers' compensation, there's nothing to protect them, no insurance, nothing. And if you get hurt, you're done, and they don't care. Um, black sanitation workers uh, are particularly treated like the garbage that they haul. And at that time, in that part of the world, people would throw their garbage in these big metal tubs in their backyard, and these guys had to go into the backyard and haul these tubs out and dump them into the truck. And they were big, and they would sometimes carry them on their heads because they're so unwieldy. And, and these things would leak. Can you imagine carrying a, a, a tub of garbage on your head? But that's what they needed to do. They couldn't ride in the cab of the truck with white drivers or white workers, 1968. Not allowed. So when it rained, they would climb into the back of the garbage truck where the garbage was dumped before it was compacted in order to stay dry. Well, on February 1st, 1968, Echo Coles and Robert Walker were riding in the back of a garbage truck. It's raining. First of February, you can imagine what that's like. And they're trying to stay dry and stay warm. The mechanism of the compactor engages. And the driver stops and tries to shut it down, but it's too late, and it drags these two men, one is 30 and the other is 36, into the compactor and crushes them to death. That's it. And the strike is on. Black garbage workers will not work anymore until there's some safety and some care for them and some decent wages. And King goes to support them in their strike. And he said, if he hadn't gone, and there were people who didn't want him to go, if he hadn't gone, it would have been like the Samaritan. He would have been like the priest or the Levite who walked by the man who needed help. And he couldn't live with that, so he had to go. So he goes in March, and he's there to speak and then to lead a march, a demonstration, peaceful, in, in Memphis. But it turns violent because they're attacked by the police, and there are some in the body that are not committed any longer to nonviolence. This is 1968, and they're getting sick of nothing changing and nonviolence making seemingly very little difference at all, and so they're going to fight back. King has to flee in order to, to save himself, to, to keep from being injured or killed. And, of course, he's, he's um, ridiculed for that and ridiculed for not having his followers in control. And... Afterwards, he's just devastated by this, and he actually thinks about quitting the whole thing. It's been a very discouraging, difficult time, and he's been stressed terribly. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he returns to Memphis. On the 3rd of April, he goes there, and he speaks at the Mason Temple, which is a, a, a Pentecostal church, a huge place in Memphis, and the place is packed out. And he doesn't feel well, but he comes to speak anyway. And he talks in this speech about the history of civil rights and the struggle to gain these rights and what's happened where and who's been leading. And he talks about the power of people, poor people who rise up together and demand their rights. And then referring to the threats that are aired, he said, the things that some of our sick white brothers are threatening to do to me, I hear these things. He said, it doesn't matter what happens to me now, because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. He said, like anyone, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain, and I have looked over, and I have seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And so I am happy tonight 
And I'm not worried about anything, and I'm not fearing any man, because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And the place goes crazy. And the next day, the country goes crazy as a man crazed with hate kills him, fires one shot as he's standing on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, April 6, 1968, late in the afternoon, waiting for others to, to gather from the room so they can go for supper. One shot, and he's shot dead. Who's driving this thing, anyway? Where's it taking us? Who's calling whom to what? After that busy day in the synagogue and then outside as people gathered at the door of Simon and Andrew's home to be healed, to be exercised, to be set free, Jesus goes off by himself to pray, to be quiet, to let things settle, to let clarity come, to, to listen for that voice. But he goes off too, I think, because there's some version of those questions swirling in his head. Where is this taking? Who's, who's driving this thing? What is this about? Who's calling whom to what? Simon and the others find him. They track him down. They say, come on, Jesus. What are you doing out here? What are you doing out here all by yourself? This is not where you're supposed to be. What are you doing in Memphis, Martin? This is not where you're supposed to be. Come on, everybody's asking for you. Everybody's looking for you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Martin. It's all about you. I've been to the mountaintop. I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Jesus says to Simon, come on, Simon, Andrew, James, John, come on. Because there are other places and people who need the message that we are called to share because it's about the message. The kingdom of God is at hand. Turn yourselves around and face into it and lean into it. The realm and time of God is at hand. The promised land of racial justice is at hand. The, the kingdom of economic justice is at hand. The promised land of social justice is at hand. The realm of God, of environmental justice, of a secure place for all God's creatures is at hand. It's, it's just on the other side. And we will get there. Because there is us. There is us, not me, not you, not Jesus alone, not Martin Luther King alone, not anyone alone, no matter how brilliant or creative or talented or charismatic, but all of us in Christ. That's the gift we are given, the gift we are called to give ourselves to. Amen.